Hello, and welcome to our 2.30 p.m. press workshop, Preparing for the 2017 Total Solar Eclipse. Our speakers today are Lika Guhatha-Kurta from NASA headquarters, Ramon Lopez from the University of Texas at Arlington, Shadia Habal from the University of Hawaii, and Alex Young, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Welcome and uh, good afternoon. I think. Do we have the podium? Stand up. Yeah. Speak, okay. Could do that. Uh, definitely. Bring this down. Um, so, we are going to talk about the 2017 solar eclipse. On Monday, August 21st, 2017, the moon will pass essentially in front of the sun and our planet, Earth, and cast what I call a long shadow, coast to coast, essentially, uh, really creating this phenomenon of eclipse, both partial and total. I think this is going to be an eclipse that's going to be the most observed, most uh, filmed and photographed, most studied and documented, and probably the most appreciated of all eclipses in human history, simply because this eclipse is going to be accessible to millions and millions of human beings, both along the path of totality, but also the various phases of the eclipse. It's going to cover the entire continent of uh, United States, and I'll show you more images of that. A total solar eclipse, I would say, is um, widely regarded as probably one of those most uh, breathtaking, amazing phenomena that you can observe from this planet Earth with your own eyes, with unaided eyes. You can actually see the outer atmosphere of the sun. And the picture that you're looking at is that um, image which just jumps out at you when the moon actually covers the bright disk of the sun. And what you're looking at over there essentially are charged particles, really electrons in the outer atmosphere that is scattering sunlight and creating this light, uh, this ethereal light, poorly halo, that we do not produce here any other way. So you really have to observe it, just filming it, seeing it in picture doesn't give you the same impression. And the reason the eclipse is structured the way they are is that it is actually mimicking the coronal magnetic field. And you're going to hear more about the science of the solar corona from Dr. Shadia Habal. This is going to be, uh, so th this particular eclipse is going to start in Oregon and going to crisscross all the way uh, through um, diagonally through South Carolina, lasting, I would say, over 90 minutes. And I think I'm going to show you uh, in the next um, image, you know, exactly how an eclipse is created. So what you see there, this is a cartoon. Uh, you see the picture of the sun, sunlight, moon in front, really, and the moon coming in front of the sun and earth creates two different kinds of shadows on our planet. The tiny dot that you're seeing there, the cone, that's called the umbral cone. That's a really narrow dot. And if you are in that dot, then you are actually going to uh, experience a total solar eclipse. That means you're going to actually see the corona. But if you are in the penumbral cone, which is kind of the blue, conical shape, then that's where you're going to see the partial eclipse, and you're going to see the sun in crescent form, much like we see the moon in its crescent form. Now, what's really interesting is that, uh, I mean, this is just a cosmic coincidence that we happen to have the sun to be about 400 times wider than the moon, and the moon, and in, it's also 400 times sort of further away uh, from the Earth than the moon. And so when we look at the sky, the apparent size of these two objects 
appear to be the same, and that's why one can completely cover the other. And so sun's bright disk, the photosphere, during a total solar eclipse can be completely covered by the moon coming in front of it so that we can see the outer atmosphere. And the reason we don't get to see this outer atmosphere during uh, you know, ordinary time when we are looking at the sun is that the corona is very faint, very dim. The brightness of the corona is sort of equivalent to a full moon night. So it's not very bright at all. I want to throw in another sort of thought and that is, as we are discovering other um, solar, other planets in other solar systems, you know, moons are not that ubiquitous. So it is really uh, just phenomenal that we have this opportunity where our moon actually allows us to see this outer atmosphere of the sun, uh, very dynamic, very hot, which is also the birthplace of solar wind, which generates space weather. And there is no other way for us to study this innermost region, even though NASA looks at the sun and occults the bright disk with many different kinds of telescopes, we can't go very close to the sun. And eclipses are these rare opportunities when we can get very close to the sun and study the solar corona. And so in this movie, what you're going to see, this, this is a uh, uh, visualization created by NASA. What you're seeing is essentially moon's shadow coming, sweeping from west to east. It travels pretty fast, like 1,700 kilometers per hour. That little red band that you're seeing and the dark circle, that is that umbral cone I was talking about. That is where if you are along that path as it sweeps through the continental USA, you are going to be able to observe the total solar eclipse, which means you're going to be able to see the corona, which is really, really important. But other places, what you're going to see is essentially crescent-shaped sun. So those are the partial phases of the sun. And if you go to NASA's uh, website, and depending on where you're going to be, you can figure out exactly what you're going to see. Are you going to witness a sort of very partial uh, solar eclipse, or are you going to experience the total solar eclipse? This particular uh, visual is actually giving you a representation of what happens when you cut off, essentially, the brightness of the sun by the moon coming in front of it. it it's called solar insulation. And the shadow is moving, and you will see the brightness gradually drop as the dark um, umbral cone is penetrating and your entire solar brightness is removed from certain areas and that's what you're looking at essentially. Now in again as I mentioned in the path of totality you're going to see the solar corona but you would be remiss if you don't look around because what happens during this phase of totality when the sun is completely blocked out by the moon is you need to look around you also. All of a sudden, you know, you see 360 degree sunset all around you. Uh, stars appear, the temperature drops. You can actually hear chirping of grasshoppers. So animals actually naturally go back to their nocturnal behavior. There are phenomenal experiences to be had during this eclipse. So while we can study the solar corona uh, in great detail, you know, from a scientific point of view, I think this eclipse actually op offers us with an opportunity to really make the connection between the sun and earth. What happens when you cut off sunlight during the middle of the day? And you, what you find is that our geospace environment is perturbed. There's going to be significant changes in the ionosphere. Uh, there's going to be a lot of changes in the upper atmosphere as the temperature drops. And as the temperature drops, you know, gradient in temperature causes interesting mix of vortex of wind. This eclipse, because it's going over this landmass, allows us to use 
all our ground-based equipment, balloons, uh, new camera technology to really gather data and kind of understand the sun-earth connection, but also study the corona in great detail. And we at NASA are going to be uh, announcing, perhaps um, early January, uh, some experiments that are actually going to focus on this interdisciplinary side of this particular eclipse. And finally, I kind of want to leave you with this thought. So, of course, this eclipse is happening in August 2017. In August, July, August time frame of 2018, we are actually going to send a probe pretty much to really sample the environment in which this uh, solar corona actually emerges and solar wind is produced and solar storms like coronal mass ejections blows out. So what you're seeing is a spacecraft that is going very close to the star. In fact, I would say this is the spacecraft that is actually going to a star. It is going to get within four million miles of the sun. And you can see the spacecraft heat shield gets hotter as it gets close to the sun. On the other side, what you're looking at is the orbital path of the spacecraft, the environment that it is going to go through. The, uh, the eclipse corona that you see is actually a dynamic corona, and you are seeing that Solar Probe Plus mission will gather uh, information locally, uh, essentially to provide ground truth validation of all the different models we have. You know, why is the corona so much hotter than the surface of the sun? Or how is the solar wind accelerated and propagates out? So we have actually, I don't know, maybe a solar stellar team uh, to talk about the history and the science we learned from Eclipse, from the actual science of solar corona, uh, from the safety, public engagement that NASA is engaged in. And so I'll pass it on to Ramon Lopez to talk more about the history and science of solar eclipse. Thank you, Lika. My name is Ramon Lopez. I'm a space scientist and professor of physics at the University of Texas at Arlington. And do I advance that here? Yes, okay. So eclipses are, as Lika described, an incredibly dramatic phenomenon and have been observed by humans forever, basically, since we were looking up at the sky. But the motion of Sun, Earth, Moon, these are regular things. And those alignments of, of Sun, Earth, and Moon follow patterns. And as civilizations developed and they became sophisticated in their record keeping, they were able to discern these patterns and predict eclipses. The ancient Chinese, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, all were able to predict eclipses. In the New World, the Maya were keen observers of the heavens. Here we see an image of El Caracol at uh, Chichen Itza, and the Dresden Codex, which was assembled at Chichen Itza in the 12th and 13th century, had a table of eclipse dates. But ancient peoples viewed eclipses as ill omens. They were harbingers of disaster, and they didn't have a scientific understanding of these things. Uh, even if they could predict them, they were still viewed as, as supernatural occurrences, generally to be feared. It was really the ancient Greeks who provided the first explanation that we might consider a natural explanation for eclipses. It was Anaxagoras who explained the eclipse of 478 BC in natural terms. He said that an object got in front of the sun, the moon. Now, he had a lot of things wrong. He, he thought that the moon was about the size of Peloponnesus, and it's much bigger than that part of Greece. But he had the right idea, and in fact, he was accused of impiety in Athens for suggesting that the sun and the moon were natural objects and not, not gods. But Pericles used that explanation in the first year of the Peloponnesian War when Athenian sailors became unnerved by uh, the, an eclipse, and, and Pericles used Anaxagoras' explanation to say this was not a supernatural thing, but a, a natural occurrence, and that they should not be afraid of that. And uh, 
almost 300 years later, actually, uh, Roman tribune and then later consul, uh, Gaius Sulpicius Gallus, the night before the Battle of Pydna in Macedonia, he had actually predicted a lunar eclipse, and he went and explained it to the Roman soldiers. I don't know that the soldiers actually believed that explanation. Romans were an incredibly superstitious lot. But the fact that he actually was able to predict that occurrence gave them confidence. Meanwhile, the Macedonians viewed it as an ill omen, and in fact, they were defeated by the Romans the next day. So even when people could predict these things, you could use it in, in that kind of way uh, to gain some kind of power, in a sense, by, uh, and Columbus did this in the New World on one of his voyages to the Caribbean uh, to gain political leverage over a local chieftain and to secure supplies. He had an almanac in his cabin, and he knew that there would be a total lunar eclipse, and he used that uh, to his advantage. Mark Twain picked up on the idea uh, when his Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, Hank Morgan, was going to be burned at the stake, he knew that there would be a total solar eclipse, and he used that to avoid being burned at the stake. So we find this idea even popping up in popular culture. But the, uh, as we move into the scientific era, as Lika explained, eclipses started to be used to do real science, and discoveries were made. This is uh, in the pre-photographic era. People used to draw eclipses. This is a drawing by Guillermo Temple of uh, total solar eclipse in 1860, where he's drawn the corona. And you'll notice that sort of swirling round shape down in the lower right of this image. That is believed by uh, most people today to be the first depiction of something we now call a coronal mass ejection, a large release of a cloud of electrically conducting pla uh, gas or plasma and magnetic field that is thrown off from the sun. And it's these coronal mass ejections, these solar clouds that propagate through the solar system that when they hit the Earth are the cause of magnetic storms. So it was th those kinds of observations were first made of the corona in the 19th century. And then in the early 20th century, just about 100 years ago, observations were made during a total solar eclipse to provide evidence for Einstein's theory of general relativity. Because Einstein said that gravity bends light. And one way you could test that is by looking at a star behind the sun. And if the starlight came close to the sun, it should be bent. And its apparent position should be different from its real position. Now, you can't see stars during the daylight, but you can during a total solar eclipse. And so in 1919, those observations were made. And that provided evidence in favor of Einstein's general theory of relativity. And even other objects can cause eclipses. This is a photograph that I took in 2012 of the transit of Venus. And Venus is there, that small black dot on the face of the sun. I had projected the image onto a piece of paper with a pair of binoculars. And it doesn't cover up the whole sun because Venus is much smaller in, in uh, size, apparent size, than the sun. As Lika said, it's, it's quite a coincidence of nature that the moon really just blocks out the sun perfectly. But this is also an eclipse, the same, same phenomena. And we are using these kinds of observations around distant stars to detect the presence of planets. By viewing a distant star, you can see the light dim as the planet moves across the face of the star. And so even now, eclipse-related science is contributing to our fundamental understanding of the universe around us. But to discuss more of the scientific work going on in eclipses, I'm going to turn it over to Shadia Havan. So good afternoon. My name is Shadia Habal, and I'm a professor uh, of astronomy at the University of uh, Hawaii. So as uh, the previous two speakers noted, uh, the sun is, uh, is an incredible astronomical observatory for us, as it is the closest star to us. So we can see things in detail that we cannot see with any other object. And uh, the advent of a total solar eclipse also provides a unique opportunity to explore this outer atmosphere of the sun that otherwise is invisible to, to, the, to the human eye. Now, uh, we, um, 
I'd like to uh, take you through a few examples as to why uh, people like myself have been leading uh, scientific eclipse expeditions for, uh, for myself, it's been since 1995, because these are unique opportunities for studying the corona. Now this, uh, although at, the, at present we have a, a fleet of, uh, of uh, observatories in space and on the ground to observe the sun, there is something that's uh, missing in, in some of the data that we collect that you can only get with total solar eclipses. So in this picture, for example, you can see that, uh, well, I, at least I'll point out to you, um, I don't see a pointer. The, the background image is, nope, it went too far. Okay, the background image is that of uh, the corona taken uh, in, uh, in 2008, during the eclipse of 2008, and I have circles that show the different fields of view of different instruments. So, for example, the first white circle is that by uh, extreme ultraviolet imagers. So their field of view extends from the surf, uh, from they see the surface of the sun, which is also uh, a, a very positive thing, uh, up to uh, this uh, inner circle. So you can see that although the details with these observatories is exquisite, just like from, for example, the Solar Dynamic Observatory at, at present, but what they're missing is anything, the extension of all these details further away from the sun. There's another uh, set of instruments called coronagraphs, which act, uh, which basically block the surface of the, of the sun so that they can see the extended corona. However, their field of view starts from this yellow circle and then goes outwards. So they miss the very intricate and important part of the corona uh, uh, starting from the solar surface. So therefore, there is a gap between these two. And the red circle is what we can see during a total solar eclipse with special filters. Uh, and the background image is what you can see with your naked eye. So it seems like you can see out to infinity when you look at the, the corona during a total solar eclipse. The inset at the bottom right here is a composite from uh, the, an image taken in the extreme ultraviolet and the eclipse at exactly the same time. And the match in the details between the two is quite astounding. So uh, there, uh, as uh, Ramon mentioned before uh, photography, people used uh, uh, to draw eclipses. And uh, Temple in 1860 captured a very unusual uh, um, feature in the corona. And so uh, what he had uh, in 2013, it was also uh, very unusual for one total solar eclipse to capture two of uh, two events like this one and uh, in the south that I'm shown with the uh, red rectangle. Uh, these are uh, what we call coronal mass ejections. They're material that is blowing away from uh, the sun. Now, uh, the, the uh, movie on the right is taken from the Lasco coronagraph uh, prior to, during, and after the eclipse. And you can see how you, the, what the, uh, uh, eclipse image, it, ca it captures the instantaneous state of the corona. And by putting it in the context of other observatories that are looking at the sun almost continuously, then you can see where this dynamic event is coming from or how it's evolving. Uh, so you can see these huge bubbles emanating from the sun uh, that uh, uh, is very well illustrated in this image. Now, going back to a static image of the corona, and it's, as I said, it's the instantaneous state of the, of the sun, there are several features here uh, that are worth uh, mentioning from a scientific point of view. First of all, uh, everything you're seeing is uh, the white light that's uh, due to the fact that you have these free streaming electrons everywhere in the corona, and what they do is they latch on to the magnetic field lines there, and they, at the same time, they're scattering the light from the solar disk uh, uh, ever, uh, all, all around uh, uh, the, the, their fields of view. And they, uh, so as observers, we're also ca catching uh, this sca uh, scattered light. So they are uh, beautiful tracers of the, the path that the magnetic field lines take starting from the solar surface all the way out to infinity. Now, in addition, there are also features that appear very nicely during total solar eclipses, and those are called prominences. They are the pinkish feature here due to, now we know, to emission from uh, neutral hydrogen, 
And uh, what's surprising is, uh, and I'll mention it, in, uh, that uh, they, they are always there. And even during the, the duration of a total solar eclipse of only a few minutes, you can see these features that are never steady. They're continuously changing. So again, uh, this is, uh, th so these observations starting from the solar surface and going out to such far distances give us uh, a, a, a exactly what's happening to the evolution of the magnetic field and the coronal uh, material or what we call plasma as they escape from the sun out to interplanetary space. Now, uh, there are other ways to look at, uh, at, the, at the corona and that's using special uh, filters. And the reason being is the visible is a, an integrated spectrum of the sun. So we know that the sun emits in, in different parts of the, of the spectrum. So if you isolate or you use a filter that takes out only a very, very small part of the spectrum, then you can see uh, the uh, different par uh, pieces of information. Now, it just so happens that the corona is very rich in one element, which is iron, in addition to other elements like you have magnesium, oxygen, carbon, uh, calcium, you name it. But the beauty of, uh, of the iron is that it has, uh, uh, it has different, it appears in different ionization states, meaning it's the, the electrons that are form the, the shells of atoms are not always there. And this was actually discovered first during a total solar eclipse, where it was the, the beginning of spectroscopy and people pointed their spectrograph towards the sun and they observed this uh, green line. And uh, it took 70 years before it was uh, uh, associated with uh, iron that had been stripped of 13 of its electrons. And this can happen only if the, mater uh, the material is very, very hot at uh, over 2 million degrees. And this was the beginning of the realization that the corona is actually a very hot place, that you have a gas that's uh, at several million degrees. So uh, by taking, uh, using filters, uh, different types of filters, you can actually isolate uh, the different, uh, uh, the behavior of the different ions of iron in the corona. So in this example, the red is uh, isolating iron that had lost 10 of its electron. And the green is isolating iron that has lost 13 of its electrons. And you can see the underlying structures uh, are, are, are very different depending on which uh, spectral line you're looking at. And therefore, you can map the temperature distribution in the corona, which is really a, a powerful technique because it's almost like you're putting a thermometer in the corona and you can tell where each, what is the temperature of each point you're looking at. Now, there's another uh, 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 very nice experiment you can do during eclipses with spectroscopy. And this uh, takes us to the last slide. And uh, what I'd like to, it, it looks a little bit uh, strange, but I will explain what it is. Uh, if you recall, and I'll go back to um, this slide here, uh, about coronal mass ejections. Now, you can capture them if, you, uh, if they are in the plane of the sky and you see, for example, the material that's streaming away from the sun. But what if uh, the material is streaming not in this plane, but actually perpendicular uh, to this plane or along the, your, uh, sorry, your line of sight? And this is exactly what was captured here. So uh, using spectroscopy, you can actually measure uh, if material is moving away from the observer or towards the observer. You can, uh, you can measure exactly the speed of this material. And in 2015, this is what happened serendipitously, is uh, the, the, we observed uh, material that was uh, almost chunks of material moving away uh, from, from the observer almost at 90 degrees with speeds ranging from 100 to 1500 kilometers per second. The other very curious and unusual uh, thing was that some of these hot material of 2 million degrees were enshrouding uh, they had like almost a, a, a um, they were forming a cocoon around bits of very, very cool material. And the cool material was coming from these prominences, which had actually uh, uh, um, broken loose from the sun and escaped into, into the, away from the sun into interplanetary space. Now, we, we knew for some time that these 
uh, prominences as they uh, escape from the sun, they are actually the trigger for these coronal mass ejections. But this was the first time that they were actually captured and, and shown to preserve their identity. So even if they're cool and dense, they didn't care about the fact that the rest of the corona was very hot. They just went along <clears throat> into interplanetary space. So I hope these examples have uh, given you a flavor for what types of experiments you can do during a total solar eclipse, but also the unique science that you are gathering that can only be achieved uh, during these uh, special events. And uh, I now turn the floor to uh, Dr. Alex Young from NASA. So thank you, Shadia. Uh, I am Alex Young, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. I'm an astrophysicist and the Associate Director for Science in the Heliophysics Science Division. And I want to talk to you uh, on this last bit about some of uh, the priorities of NASA, and in particular, safety around the eclipse. And NASA has a lot of interest in the eclipse uh, around safety. We're interested in the science of the eclipse, we're very interested in public engagement, education, and in addition in citizen science. But I want to focus on safety. Uh, what are the safety concerns that we have during eclipse and what's the best way to make the most of it and observe this really amazing natural phenomenon? Um, now during an eclipse, uh, there's really only one time that you can safely look at the sun and that is during totality. So if you're fortunate enough to be in the path of totality, during that brief moment of around two and a half minutes, you are able to look at the sun safely. It's about as bright as a full moon. You know, the brightest stars and planets will come out. So just like looking at the full moon, it's completely safe during that brief period to look at the sun. And in fact, you should absolutely look at it directly to really appreciate and enjoy it. But otherwise, during times of partial eclipse, whether you're in the path or outside where you will only experience a partial eclipse, it's very important that if you're going to look directly at the sun that you have the appropriate safety equipment. Now the simplest thing you can do is get a pair of solar or eclipse viewing glasses. Um, these are all over the country, they're coming out slowly from many different organizations, millions and millions of them. And these are made so that you can look at the sun in general or look at during an eclipse. And what you need to do is make sure that you're not looking at the sun first, looking down, looking away. Put the glasses on. You should see absolutely nothing. It should be completely black. And then when you get up to the sun, that's the only thing you should see. Now, one of the things to point out, if you have these, make sure that they're not scratched, they don't have a hole in them, because at that point, it's too dangerous to use them, so you should unfortunately toss them out. Um, but this is uh, really important. Now, there are glass, special glasses that you can get that are uh, using uh, welding filters, for example, but you have to make sure that these are appropriately made for looking at the sun. These particular ones, are certified, made by three different companies in the US. So this is really important. Now, in addition to looking at the eclipse uh, directly, then the rest of the time uh, during the uh, total solar eclipse, you wanna look at it with also one of the possible projection methods. Before I go to that, I wanted to show you, this is a sequence of the uh, totality going from partial eclipse where the moon partially blocks out the sun, you get a crescent sun. As it moves closer and closer to totality, you get to the point where you see these bright features on the edge called Bailey's beads, which is due to the moons, the, the mountains on the moon, and the sunlight passing through it. And then right before you get to totality, there's a bright flash often called the engagement ring or the wedding ring. Um, and then you reach that point of totality, that brief period where you can see the beautiful corona. Um, and during the, pre the previous times, before you get to totality, uh, you can use these or you can use a projection method, pinhole projections, uh, any of these sort of means. Now, I'll go back. 
this website, eclipse2017.nasa.gov slash safety, has a discussion of this. We talk about uh, all of the aspects of safety as well as links where you can see how to make your own projectors. There are, in fact, uh, uh, commercial ones that you can buy, but they're relatively straightforward to make. And we have even a safety message. And this safety message in the discussion was put together by uh, NASA, the American Astronomical Society, the uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology, American Academy of Optometrists, and the National Science Foundation. So just to show you some examples, they're, again, very straightforward to do projection methods to look during times of uh, partial eclipse. Um, really, all you need is a box, some tinfoil, tape, and uh, a, po a pointed pin or uh, a pin to poke a hole through. And all you're going to be doing is making a pinhole to project the sun. You can make them of different sizes. This is actually a fun one you can do where you can put your head inside of the box. Um, you can even take a mirror, put it inside of an envelope, and make a ragged hole about a centimeter and a half and project that image from the sun onto a wall, a piece of paper, or something like that. So there's a lot of easy ways to do it and to view the eclipse safely. So just remember, during times of partial eclipse, whether you're in the path of totality or outside of it, always use the appropriate safety equipment. Never look directly with telescopes or binoculars, and don't even use these glasses with things like telescopes or binoculars. These should be used by themselves. Those can only be used with the appropriate solar filters. And then there are many projection methods. But make sure that if you're in the path of totality, during totality, you take these off because you're going to miss everything if you're wearing these. So thank you very much. OK, so now we'll open up the floor to questions. Uh, I'm Harvey Leifert, freelance writer. Have any of your organizations gone to the exercise of plotting the best places to view the eclipse in terms of traditional weather patterns where it will be less or no clouds at all and length of totality and so on so you can advise us where we should go? Shall I answer that one? Sure. Uh, yes, the answer is there are uh, many people who have uh, done this work. Uh, there's uh, Jay Anderson has been involved. He's a meteorologist, and he has been involved in uh, looking at weather statistics for eclipses for over 30 years. And there's uh, another uh, website uh, called, I think the, the NASA website also gives it, but there's another website called Great American Eclipse that combines uh, the weather statistics together with the, uh, with the geographical locations so that you can uh, tell uh, what the weather is going to be like, the duration, et cetera. And uh, what I would add um, is that you, you want dry conditions, you know, being on top of mountain, Wyoming is a good place. West Coast is better, less humidity than East Coast. But what's really interesting about eclipses, and I, I have been to nine and I have missed seeing three, is that as I was describing, do you, eclipses create its own microclimate. So things can happen, actually. Cloud will sometimes come or disperse. So there are those things happening simply because of the change uh, along the you know, vertical profile of our atmosphere. But you want low humidity, basically. That's one of the criterion if you want to see that a beautiful blue sky and coronal conditions. Rick Lovett, freelance. I have a related question. You may have just answered it. Um, I, I want to know whether my house is under the path of totality. Um, it's going to be really, really close. Um, where do I find a really detailed map? So I think uh, Alex can probably tell you a little bit more, but his website, actually, that the, the NASA website has a map called Deep Dive. So for the first time, what we have been able to do is take um, information from LRO mission and actually create. So I showed you an 
umbral cone, right, which gives you the path of totality. Now that cone is not actually a circle because it's, it's the moon's shadow. So if you know moon's topography, then you're going to see that uh, circle actually turn into kind of polygonal, but it's not just that alone. It's also the topography of our planet that it begins to interact with. And so the resolution with which this map has been created is I think kind of creates a difference of, of the order of two to three kilometers. And that's you know between seeing a total solar eclipse and not seeing one. So I think this is up on the website. Alex. It is, now that one is just a, a video at this point. Uh, that will change. We do have on the eclipse2017.nasa.gov, uh, we have maps that are, that are Google Maps. So you go in, uh, we've got the, the path of totality, and you can zoom in. Now, if you're right on the edge of the path of totality, you're not going to get that detail that she's talking about. That will be available very soon um, because it is pretty amazing. You can, if you just look at the videos, this is all coming from our researchers and visualizers at the Scientific Visualization Studio, svs.gsfc.nasa.gov. And there you can actually see, it's very, it's pretty crazy. The, the um, umbral shadow is not a nice circle, oval, ellipse. It's actually a bizarre polygon. And it looks like some sort of computer artifact. But it is, in fact, a combination of the um, topography and, uh, I'm sorry, Typology. One of my father is a typographer, so um, and the uh, the mountains, the structure on the moon. So you can see the two of those together, um, and we'll have that up soon, so that you can actually interactively go in, especially if you're right on the edge of, of totality. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, the Great Amer Amer Great American Eclipse dot uh, com is one where, I mean, uh, it's uh, developed by. Uh, Michael Seiler, and he has all those details. Yeah, and and yeah. and so Michael Seiler, I know, is working with uh, Ernie Wright, um, and actually, yeah. Michael Seiler is a uh, uh, a cartographer, makes these amazing maps, and Ernie's the the guy that's sticking the data into the maps. So, hi, I'm Rebecca Boyle. I'm a freelancer. Also, I'm wondering if you can give us a preview of some of the coronal science you might be able to do with this, and if anything. I wonder about doing some like correlation between different observatories across the continent. Like as the eclipse occurs in one place, then you go to another place to look at it and compare your data. And this might be a really uninformed question, but could you like fly in Sophia or something along the eclipse path and do stuff, or does that not make sense? Well, well I'll let I'll let. Her her talk mostly about the science. As far as Sophia, Sophia does not look at the sun. It is unfortunate, would love that, but Sophia is an infrared instrument and heat is a, a good thing and a bad thing. So the sun is just a blinding, blinding, blinding source even then. So uh, unfortunately, Sophia is not going to be looking at the eclipse. And also, if, if you did have an instrument on an aircraft, the shadow is moving much faster than the aircraft, so you wouldn't be able to, to follow it for very long. Yeah. Yeah, so you extend the, uh, from the aircraft, you extend your uh, your totality to maybe double the um, time, but but you also have to take into account the jitter from, from flying. So as far as, I mean, the beauty of this eclipse is it's uh, the whole stretch across the US is about 3,000 miles, and as you pointed rightfully, uh, if you have stations across the U.S. Uh, uh, carrying out identical with identical e uh, equipment, you can uh, do, for example, you can do spectroscopy, you can do imaging in uh, different uh, spectral lines. Uh, so you can, uh, one, uh, maximize your chances of getting good data. Second is to follow the fine details of uh, changes in the corona over time scales of maximum 90 minutes. So every... Uh, so it's a minute, a, um, every, it's, um, it's about a kilometer a minute. But uh, the thing is, uh, if you are, let's say, for example, 600 miles apart, then you will uh, see changes on the order of 15 minutes. So this is the type of uh, um, 
experiments that myself, my team, and other people are doing. Uh, unfortunately, the equipment is, is very expensive. So uh, it's not, uh, although the opportunity is there to have the funds to do it, is not readily available. Yeah, and, and so just one additional thing. I mean, uh, one of the things we've taken uh, very clever people have taken advantage of is the idea of citizen science. So um, there's a group at the NSO, National uh, Solar Observatory, Matt Penn, is uh, setting up sites across the country. I think it's going to have uh, 80, around 80 sites yes. uh, with high quality cameras with a lot of uh, support from industry to have observations all along the path. Yeah, with identical equipment. With identical so equipment, can, exactly. I mean, if you just have regular, yeah, okay. So there, there, there's a whole host of other activities going on exactly related to what you're asking. So Citizen Kane is a great example where you actually are going to employ students to do the same experiment over the entire path. We'll have of the order of, I think, 40 or 50 balloons dispersed, you know, really, again, taking imagery, doing temperature profile, doing local measurements. Uh, we will have ground-based observations from NOAA and other agencies really measuring the local conditions. Um, we are um, going to actually deploy airplane. And so we might have some infrared observations from airplanes. So this is all this is actually an active phase where we are trying to figure out exactly the kind of science we can support. So there might be two or three airplanes that will be carrying instruments, you know, both that is of scientific quality, uh, including infrared, but also um, just visual, because that's, a, uh, that's really important. But capturing it from uh, coast to coast so that you can begin to start streaming the data down so people can begin to actually get engaged as it begins on the west coast and then move towards the east coast. Uh, there's going to be studies on social behavior and there's going to be studies on animal behavior because this is a, this, and you know, I think people at NSF, NIH, I mean, people are engaged. There are different kinds of activities, not just the solar science, but the connection of the sun to our planet, as I had indicated, you know, what's going to happen in the ionosphere, for example, or what's going to happen uh, in the atmosphere. We are going to be looking at all of that during this eclipse. In addition to the things that have been discussed so far, there will also be detailed comparisons between the observations and numerical simulations of the coronal behavior. These kinds of numerical simulations are very important for space weather prediction. And as Yogi Berra said, prediction is hard, especially about the future. So we need to be able to validate models to understand how well those models are able to give us the detailed understanding of the corona and then eventually what's happening between the sun and the earth and what happens when these solar influences hit the earth so we can have better space weather prediction. Uh, Harvey Leifert again. Uh, am I correct in assuming that the sun will be high overhead through the whole trajectory across the continent? Yes. Yes. Uh, Rick Lovett again. Um, I have a safety question on this one. Um, if you're, what is the tolerance on making mistakes with the glasses? I mean, obviously, if, if you're watching it and a Bailey's bead appears, um, you you turn away, but uh, uh, presumably you don't go blind in one second. No, I mean, I think you know, just like we turn up and see the sun, and we immediately see it's bright, and we look away. I mean, there's 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 no difference there, and just the fact that. We walk out every so often and we look up in the sky and we go, oh, I just moved towards the sun and I got to move away real quick. So, you're, yeah, you're not going to go blind like that. Can I add to this? Yes. Uh, it might be difficult to catch it at the beginning of the eclipse because you, ha you have one before and one after. So while you're having your protective glasses, then if you don't know the exact time of totality, you will wait till you can't see anything, then you remove your glasses. But while you're watching, then towards the end, you will see the diamond ring, and that's still safe, just this instant to see it, and it's glorious, and then you should then put you your look away, yeah. 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 You need to look away before. No, no. No, 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 no. Okay, any other questions from reporters in the room? 
Any questions from the chat? Nope. Okay, well that concludes the workshop. Thank you very much. We'll reconvene at 4 p.m. with sharing big hard ideas with many kinds of people.